Hi guys, welcome back aboard good old Athena. This week I'm going to be improving the reliability and adding a bit of redundancy to our Volvo D240 by completely being able to bypass the little MDI black box on the engine. If you have a Volvo D series engine, it might very well be worth it to do something similar to what I'm going to be doing here because those little MDI boxes have a horrible reputation. Also this week I'm going to be installing a pump for doing oil changes and a couple of other smaller jobs. My name is Mess, this is my wife Ava. I've spent the last five years on a somewhat extensive refit of our 1987 Warrior 38 named Athena. That was a DIY fun-packed adventure complete with a very extensive osmosis treatment, building a new rudder using vacuum infusion, rebuilding the entire deck, gutting and subsequently rebuilding most of the interior, painting the top sides and a ton of other projects. The summer of 2021, we started cruising full time. Now we're finally ready to begin our adventure. If you ask me, Volvo has a little bit of an image problem on their hands because those MDI boxes or mechanical diesel interface, which is what MDI stands for, have a reputation for just dying for a number of reasons. It's something that's been going on for years and years and years, and it just kind of comes across as if Volvo doesn't really care all that much about it. This right here is the issue. This cost me 450 pounds or roughly 600 US dollars. That is a pricey ticking time bomb. The MDI box is the link between the controls here in the cockpit and the engine. So if the MDI box dies, then we won't be able to start and stop the engine from the cockpit. I can still hotwire the starter with a screwdriver, but that's not really going to be a lot of fun in any kind of a sea state. And also, if we do that, we won't have anything monitoring oil pressure or engine temperature. So certainly not ideal. In this video, I hope to be able to add some redundancy to our engine so that we can, one, turn the engine on without the MDI box and without using a screwdriver to be able to monitor coolant temperature and oil pressure again without the MDI box and three be able to automatically turn on and off our high output alternator again without the MDI box. This project is going to be a great opportunity to play around with some relays. Relays are great for controlling high current devices like for instance this horn using a low current circuit and relays are something every boat owner should be familiar with if for no other reason than to be able to diagnose when you've got a bad one. The relays I've got here are double relays. That is simply just two relays smushed together independently of each other in one enclosure. On a typical relay you'll see either four or five pins instead of the eight I've got here. On the bottom of the relay there are some numbers 30, 85, 86 and 87. Pin 86 and 85 are the coil pins. Pin 30 and in my case 87 are the switch pins. Some relays will also have an 87A pin. That is basically just a normally closed switch. That means there's connection from 30 to 87A when there's no current flowing through the coils down here, then once you apply current, then the switch will jump to 30 and 87. Here is what I'm hoping to cobble together. Of course, I haven't seen this working yet, so I don't know if it will actually work, but the fingers crossed. I'll need three separate relays for this project. One for controlling a horn in the event of a loss of oil pressure, another relay for controlling the horn in the event of high coolant temperature, and then a third one for controlling the high output alternator brain box. Once the oil pressure comes up, I want the brain box to get notified so it can start the alternator without me having to do anything. Here's most of the stuff I'll need for this project. I've got this adapter plate that'll sit in between the engine and the oil filter that'll allow me to add another oil pressure switch and that's this guy. This is a slightly fancy oil pressure switch. As you can see it's got three connections here on the top. On a typical pressure switch you might only find one connection but that's because this guy has built in both a normally open and normally closed switch. I've got two of these double relays. I only really need three relays, but that's okay. I've got this temperature controller for monitoring the coolant temperature. And of course this horn for letting us know if the coolant temperature or the oil pressure is out of whack. Last but not least, I've picked up this engine start button so that we can still start the engine in the event of an MDI failure without resorting to the hot wiring screwdriver method. All of this hinges on me being able to install this oil pressure switch on the engine using this adapter plate. So that's gonna to be our first job. 
But before we get to that, I need to drain the oil from the engine. And uh, to do that, I figured it'd be a good idea to install this guy. This is a Marco UP3 oil gear pump. It's specifically made for doing stuff like this, for transferring oil. And this is something that I think is gonna make our life a lot easier in the future. The suction side of the pump gets connected to this that we can then use to suck out the pump from the engine, the sail drive, and also the gen set. On the output side of the pump, we'll have this hose that we can just put into any container for discarding the used oil. And just like that, we've got a working pump in here for doing oil changes. That means no more big, bulky, hand pumpy, vacuumy thingy that's gonna take up a lot of room on the boat. So yeah, I think this is a nice upgrade. One of the big themes here about Athena this year is getting Ava up to speed so she can do everything on the boat here on her own. And that includes oil changes on the engine. So why don't we have her do the pumping out of the oil? Okay, Ava, what's the first step? Step number one is to pump the oil out. Well, step number one is to heat the oil up. Right, 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 right. As it's very commonly known that to heat up the oil, you have to turn on the engine. You gotta press and hold. With the new fancy pump, I'm pretty sure we could easily pump out the oil without running the engine first, but running the engine is certainly gonna lower the viscosity and make the pump's life just a little bit easier. With the engine nice and warm, the next step is to find the dipstick. Ava, where's the dipstick? Uh, right here. Nice, good job. <laughs> if you look on your right hand side, there is a yellow tubey thingy. I found it. Okay. How far in? Just push it as far as it'll go. Okay. Now you grab the empty oil container that's right behind you. Yep, that guy. Mm -hmm. Just gotta make sure that valve is open. Okay. And we know that is, oh, there, okay, that's open. Three, two, one. <gasps> it looks like the little black tube that actually goes into the engine is just a little bit too short. We can't quite get to the bottom of the sump, but yeah, for now, that's okay. Yep, then you just close the valve. Okay. And wipe it dry. So what's the next step, Ava? We have to replace the filter. Yep, at least we have to remove it for now because I need to get that adapter plate on there. But uh, okay. yeah, do you know where the oil filter is? I'm gonna say it's a 50-50 shot. Yeah. <laughs> it's this bottom one. You are correct. So now for the fun part, go ahead and remove that filter. <laughs> I feel like I'm on like Survivor or something. Like there's no, just twist. Lefty, tidy, righty. Like oil isn't gonna spew out everywhere? It is. <laughs> really? Is that what this, do I put this below? Yeah, just a little bit. It's, it's not gonna be that much. After a little bit of swearing and cursing, the oil filter has been removed. Now for the part of this that I'm the most nervous about, and that's to see if the adapter plate fits so that there is enough room for the pressure switch. The pressure switch is a little bit of a chunky monkey, and it seems like there's not gonna be a whole lot of room left over, so fingers crossed. The adapter plate comes with these four bolts here for the holes you don't need. It also comes with these three adapters. You gotta pick the one that fits your engine. For mine, it seems to be this three quarter inch one. I've just done a quick little test fit and it is going to be very tight but it looks like we'll get away with it. To seal around the threads I'm using a little bit of Loctite 577. This stuff is awesome for diesel, oil and I've also used it for some of the heating plumbing. I'm 99% sure this stuff is not okay to use with drinking water which is a shame because it is a lot easier to apply than any kind of Teflon tape. 
It's going to be a little bit difficult for me to get to this once it's installed, so I've made the cables so that I can attach these spade connectors before installing the thing. And I've even labeled the cables here so I can see which one is the common, normally off and normally on. Let's cross our fingers and hope that the adapter with the giant pressure switch on there still fits. The O-ring is going to be facing the engine and then this is going to go through here and actually secure the thing in place and also allow us to attach the oil filter again. The adapter should now be in place. It was a little bit of a fiddly job to tighten this guy, but he should be on there now. While I was messing about down here, I noticed this little guy. It turns out the D240 has a dedicated little tube for draining oil from the sump, which is not as long as the one where the dipstick sits in, so I was able to get all of the oil out. I've always just used the dipstick tube because my old Volvo didn't have that feature, but yeah. Either way, I think it'll get you there as long as your suction doodad is long enough. I fired up the engine to check the pressure switches and everything seemed perfect. On to wiring the relays. I've always wanted Athena to look like she had some kind of mysterious doomsday weapon installed and this box is probably the closest I'm ever gonna get. The innocent looking switch down here simply just turns on the light in the engine compartment. The more dangerous looking switch up here with the toggle guard arms the system. Once the system is armed, then the horn will start howling until oil pressure comes up, then it'll shut off and it'll only come on again if oil pressure drops or if this temperature controller gets tripped because the coolant gets too warm. By having the horn come on as soon as we arm the system and until oil pressure is up, every time we use this box to start the engine, well then we'll get to test the system to see that the horn works. Now keep in mind this box is only for use if the MDI box fails again. But yeah, if that happens, then starting the engine is as simple as arming the system and hitting this engine start button. To be able to have the engine start button located here on the box, I have used a slightly beefier relay here, a 100 amp one. Right now, this is looking a little bit messy, but before I start trying to tidy this up, I just want to do a quick little bench test to see that all of this is working the way it's supposed to. If I turn on my little power supply here, and we should see 12 volts, if I turn on the lights also, we should see 12 volts here. Yep. You can also see that the temperature controller here has come on even before we've armed the system. I figured that was a nice little detail always to be able to see the temperature. Of course, I don't have the oil pressure switch here, but I can fake it by simply just taking this wire that is for the pressure switch and connecting it to the negative on the light side. And that means once I arm the system, the horn should start a howling. This is supposed to be 105 decibels, so it, yeah, this is probably going to be loud. <coughs> yep, that was very unpleasant. Let's disconnect this pressure switch again, just to fool the system into thinking that the oil pressure is good. Now we should be able to arm it without having the horn go off. Ah, phew. Now if I press the engine start button, we should hear the relay clickety clacky. Nice. As you've seen, this just consists of three relays, a temperature controller, a couple of switches, and the horn. Very simple, but this is going to be really nice to have if or when the MDI box dies again. After having replaced the Wago nuts with a little bit of solder to connect all the wires, it still looks a little bit messy in here, but I think I will be able to close the lid and then the mess in there will just be our little secret. I've chosen to mount the box here inside of the engine compartment. It's very easy to get access to this area, so in case we need to turn on the engine with the box, it's not a big deal, and this will give me the shortest run and the least messy wiring. In the video, it's only been a split second, but in reality, it's been about six hours, and I'm a little over halfway done wiring this thing up, but at least now, I've got lights in the engine compartment. The better to see all the dirt and grime. Maybe next week I can persuade my lovely wife to clean the engine compartment. That would be really awesome. But uh, yeah, let me get the last bit of wiring out of the way. Pardon the mess in here, but the brain box for the high output alternator is now hooked up to that relay and it turns on and off with the engine. 
Yes. That might not sound like a big deal, but up until now we've had to manually turn on the alternator when we went sailing and then remember to turn it off. Otherwise we could damage the alternator. So having that be automatic is a big step up. I believe I could have gotten ignition or a plus 12 volts when the engine is running, which is what the brain box needs to turn on but then I would be relying on the MDI box. I think having the alternator come on when the oil pressure comes up in the engine is a much better solution. But uh, yeah, let me go ahead and wire up the last bit of stuff. I've made myself a couple of cables here. Those are attached to the relay. I'm gonna attach the other end to the center pin here and this yellow and red one. While I'm at it, I'm gonna go ahead and move the MDI box off of the engine and onto the side of the engine compartment. Some of the forum posts I've read about the MDI boxes mentioned that maybe vibration and heat is not the best for them. So yeah, anything to see if we can prolong the life of the little thing. The MDI box is now firmly mounted on the side of the engine compartment and I've connected the relay. It's not mounted yet, but it's connected. I've disconnected the horn, so there won't be that blaring now, but the uh, Go ahead and take the system for a spin. Of course, if the MDI box fails, then I can't stop the engine out from the cockpit, but there is a little manual stop here on the side of the engine, right down here. And it even very conveniently says stop on it. I am thoroughly pleased with my doomsday box. I've attached the probe from the temperature controller to the freshwater side of the engine's cooling system with a little bit of silicone tape and a zip tie. Unfortunately, I've run out of conduit, so that's why the wiring for the lights is just dangling here, but uh, yeah, I can fix that next week. I think easily being able to turn on the engine, even with a dead MDI box, and still being able to monitor oil pressure and temperature is a big improvement and it gives me a good amount of peace of mind. I really wish Volvo would offer something like the box I've built here considering the reputation of their MDI boxes, but then again if it was offered by Volvo it would probably be horrendously expensive. By going the DIY route here I've spent a little over the equivalent of 200 US dollars. I got the idea to monitor oil pressure using one of those adapter platey thingies from a friend of mine named Chris. I did not know that those adapter things were a thing before he showed me one. I think they're really cool and I hope some of you guys might be able to use one of those for something useful. If you want more information about the doomsday box I've cobbled together, like for instance a list of parts or maybe a slightly updated wiring diagram, all of that is going to be in the blog post Ava's going to put together to go along with this video. That should be up in a couple of days, so check out saillifechannel.com. Next week we're finally unstepping the mast to replace the sheaves at the top of the mast, replace the VHF antenna, the coax cable and the cable that goes to the camera at the top of the mast and also there's a couple other smaller jobs and also next week if the wind comes down a little bit I should be able to get the first of the two solar panels on our solar arch installed. On that hopeful note we'll end this week's video here. We hope to see all you guys back here aboard Athena next week for yet more DIY fun. As always feel free to leave a comment down below and don't forget if you've enjoyed this video please remember to leave a like. See you!